Andy Bustamante, welcome to the show, man. Dude, I'm super stoked to be here. Uh, it's been awesome catching up before and off camera, so I'm really happy to do it now on camera. Me too, me too. So we're just gonna do a warm up round, just a little bit about you for this segment. You are a former CIA operative. You've worked all over the world. Everyday carry is a big topic on this channel. It always has been. And so what I'm wanting to know is what does the everyday spy carry on them every day? Yeah, you know, when it comes to everyday carry, there's a lot of misconceptions about spies and EDC. Because a spy's job is to be covert. A spy's job is to blend in. So anything that we carry on us has to be something that blends in, that doesn't draw attention, and that withstands something that we call cover scrutiny. Because if somebody stops us, if a police officer stops us, or if a child bumps into us, or if we get hit by a car and an ambulance comes to help us, we have to fit within our cover identity. So what we carry on us is a big part of what identifies your true affiliation, your true identity. So if you can imagine a spy getting hit by like a, a motorcycle in Vietnam, that's a normal occurrence. Like getting hit by a traffic in Vietnam is pretty common. If an ambulance rolls up to you and you're carrying a Glock or you're carrying a, a hidden knife, and especially if it's got some kind of seal on it that associates you with you know, uh, the US government or US military, all of a sudden you don't look like whatever your cover legend was business person, uh, traveling tourist, whatever it might be. So our everyday carry is very, very different from that of the average person. So a couple things. One, we always wear shoes with laces. It sounds silly, but we always wear shoes with laces because you've got to always be ready to beat feet. Whether you're trying to run away or run towards something, laced shoes are far superior to sandals, to slip-ons, to, to anything else, right? We also always carry $100, US dollars, Depending on where we are in the world, most places in the world, 100 US dollars gets you pretty much anywhere you need to go. Really? 100 dollars? 100 US dollars gets you pretty much anywhere you need to go in 80% of the, of, the, of the world. Have you used that before? Oh yeah, absolutely. Can you give I've us gotten an myself, example? Yeah, so, so I've gotten myself uh, across rivers and across national borders in Southeast Asia because I had US currency in five and $10 denominations. Just wave over a fishing vessel and be like, hey, I need to get to that side of the river. That side of the river is the difference between being in you know, Thailand or being in Burma sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't really care. They don't, to, to have a $5 US bill, that's the equivalent of, 50, of 150 Thai currency of, you know, uh, and, that's, and that's 150 pieces of Thai currency if it was Thai currency. The fact that it's a US dollar bill actually brings more value than if it was the currency of the local country, because now they have a US dollar, a US bill along with it, right? A minted US bill. I would totally agree with that. What about first world countries? First world countries gets a little bit trickier because in a first world country, you know, your Germany's, your Poland's, your Romania's, um, it's a little bit tough because uh, they are built around the euro. Sometimes the euro has more value than the US dollar, mm -hmm. but there's still an element of the fact that the US dollar has been the chief currency of the world. So they still are happy to take US dollars. They're still happy to take US currency. And they're also still happy to, uh, to take cash for services. Because again, unlike the United States, the United States is a legalistic country. Like, uh, as much as people complain about corruption and deceit and whatever else in the United States, it does not compare at all to what exists in Europe, right? Prostitution is legal in Germany. You can get basically anything you want in the Caucasus or even as far as Romania, and Romania is a, a NATO country. Mm -hmm. You can grease the skids anywhere into any political office, into any business deal, into any manufacturing deal. Uh, with with U.S. dollars, with currency, you can you can whether you want to call it a bribe or whether you want to call it a service fee, whatever you want to call it, there's a lot of flexibility in uh, certain morals that here in the United States we've legalized or we've legalistically legalistically constrained. So that's I, why a hundred dollars in U.S. currency is absolutely on my everyday carry list. Interesting. I, it, 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 I totally agree with you. I've I've done it as well, but um, but in first world countries, $100 is 
I've personally found to be a little bit harder to bribe with. It's so it's so what I'm asking country is specific. Do you okay, do you up the do you up the dollar amount when you're in first world countries? Yes. So I'll move it up to more like if I know that I'm going specifically if I know I'm going to Europe, that number turn that number doubles. It becomes two hundred US dollars. Right. And what really happens is it becomes a hundred US and a hundred in local currency. Okay. But they'll still be and that's untouchable money. That's not the spending money. That's the money that gets stuck into like an extra crevice in the wallet. And then I actually put my ATM money on top of that. So you're 60, 80, 70 euros, whatever it's going to be that you get through the day with. But your emergency, because EDC is about emergency, really. Yeah. It's about being there when you need it. So that, to that, that 100 US and 100 local currency or 200 local currency, Europe is good because euros are accepted everywhere for the most part. But there's, I mean, it sucks. It sucks to get stuck in, in uh, a, a, Euro, a, a European country where euros are not used as the main currency. And then they don't know whether the euro is real or not, but they do trust the US dollar. There's just, there's all sorts of stuff that gets sticky. In the United States, even in the United States, a first world country, 100 US dollars is actually quite effective. That's more than enough to get, uh, to get a cabbie to take you somewhere for cash. That's more than enough to get a driver to at least give you a ride somewhere. Like you can do a lot. That's, if you wave down somebody outside of a freaking Costco or a Walmart, and you give them $100 in cash, dude, they'll take you pretty much anywhere, yeah. right? Uber drivers drive 16 or 30 miles to get paid $16. Like it's, it's you never underestimate the value of cash. Plus cash specifically is untraceable. Credit cards leave a trail. Venmo leaves a trail. There's, there's digital pixie dust on everything, but cash is still something that you can use so that nobody can track it. So that makes you safe, but it also makes whoever helps you safe because neither of you can be linked together and neither of you can be linked back to the transaction. Speaking of currency, do you carry anything else with currency? Like for an example, when I was working at the agency, I purchased a Rolex because Rolex is universal. Everybody knows what it is. It's always on you and so it's real easy to, here you go. So what I'll actually do, so the days, the problem with material goods is that material goods, like a Rolex, require two steps before it can be liquidated. So you might give somebody a, a Rolex, but then they've got to actually go and pawn it, trade it, sell it, whatever else. And sometimes you need a favor that isn't a Rolex favor, mm -hmm. right? So what I would actually recommend is instead use, especially if you're not in a covert capacity, get an international credit card, right? This is one of the things that I tell people all the time. Find yourself a, a Chase, uh, a USA Bank, even an American Express, because you're gonna pay $250 a year to have that American Express, but you could be anywhere in the world and run that thing through an ATM and have instant local currency. Mm -hmm. So now if you need a $50 favor, you run, the you run the credit card, you got a $50 favor. You need a $500 favor, you run the credit card, you got a $500 favor. You need a $5,000 favor, you run the credit card, you got a $5,000 favor. You know what I mean? I do. It's so much easier. It, it's traceable because it puts your credit card in that machine, but that's it. Nobody knows what it was for after that. Okay. Interesting. So I would say laced shoes, everyday carry, international credit card, everyday carry, $100 US if you're, if you're in a third world or developing country, $200 US if you're in the United States or if you're in a first world country. And then uh, the only thing we carry on top of that, or the only thing I would recommend carrying on top of that is a literal, uh, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Whenever you weatherize a piece of paper, help me out here. A laminated. Thank you. A laminated short list of the seven most important phone numbers to you, right? Mother-in-law, mother, father-in-law, father son, daughter, sisters, whatever it might be. Because if you're incapacitated, that weatherproof piece of paper, that laminated piece of paper is something EMTs can use, police can use, people can reference. If you're busted up in the face, you can point and people can find the phone number that you need. If your phone dies, if your phone is stolen, right? People don't steal a piece of laminated paper. And you can carry it in your wallet, you can carry it in your freaking sock, you can carry it in your chest pocket, you can carry it anywhere you want to and not have to worry about sweat, rain, or anything else. Those are the, kind, those are the four things that we're trained to carry all the time. Because it doesn't matter what covert capacity you're in. If you're incapacitated, attacked, mugged, taken in for questioning, None of those four things break your cover. You, you withstand cover scrutiny 
in any country that you're in, you can, you can withstand cover scrutiny with those four items. Interesting. What about, well, actually, I got another question. So being a CIA spy, if you can talk about it, what is the coolest piece of gear that you've carried from the science and technology department over there? Man, there is some really cool tech that they come up with. The, the, mo the majority of the tech that they come up with is still heavily classified. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't really talk much about it. Uh, what I would say in general terms is one of my favorite things. Uh, they have a way of making it so that you can open pretty much any hotel room door with the same key card. Nice. So like the, <laughs> you're supposed to use it. <laughs> you're supposed to use it so that you can get into somebody else's hotel room. But man, we all love that piece of equipment for ourselves. Cause it's just kind of like, so it doesn't matter where you're staying. You just, it's a piece of plastic. So I don't even care about losing my, my local hotel card. It's just scan this thing pretty much anywhere I need to go. And I've got an open door. Nice. Nice. I've not seen that yet. <laughs> <laughs> but now I'm gonna go look and, and try to find one. What about here at home? Do you carry a firearm? So in the United States, what I actually I don't carry a firearm myself on me every day. What I carry around my uh, what I carry near to person is a baton. Okay. So I carry batons. I carry uh, uh, actual audio alarms, and I I teach my family to carry the same thing. Those are those are tools that I prefer because they're they're less likely to ever accidentally discharge. When, when I've got children around, when I've got family around, when I've got my children's friends around, to store and, and secure a weapon makes it so that you can't actually reach that weapon when the worst things happen. Mm -hmm. So what I prefer is a weapon I can always reach. A baton, the only way you hurt somebody with a baton, especially if it's a collapsible baton, you have to extend it and then strike. My, my kid's neighborhood son can step up, pick it up off the ground and hand it to me and say, what's this? And nobody's nervous about that, mm -hmm. right? It's like picking up a pipe or picking up a flashlight and saying, what's this? But if your seven-year-old neighbor's son walks in and picks up your, your Glock, you're gonna be like freaking out, right? That's not a story anybody wants to share. Same thing with an audio alarm. I, I also like audio alarms because it's really easy to teach even like a three-year-old how to use an audio alarm. You clip the thing to their backpack, when they go to daycare, you clip a thing to their backpack when you go for a walk in a public place, and you show them that if they ever get scared, if anything bad happens, they just pull a cord, and the whole alarm goes off. And you got 180 decibels calling everyone's attention to that child, right? So now if there's a molester or a kidnapper or somebody who's shady, once that person hears the alarm go off, they're gone. They don't want the attention of everybody in the local vicinity looking at them, right? Yeah. So for me, I find that audio alarms and batons are far superior, uh, again, to the lifestyle I lead, because I don't want to have to. I don't want to be two steps away from a firearm when I need it. If you don't have children, or if you have older children that are trained around firearms, it's a whole different story. Interesting. I like that alarm idea. I'm going to use that when my son gets older. Oh yeah. Well, I don't know if you'd ever considered carrying a firearm, but I got a buddy, Jason, over at SIG. I told him you were coming on here. Oh, man. And uh, he wanted me to, to show you this thing. I'm interested to hear your, your opinion on it. Oh, look at this guy. So, that is unloaded. Yeah. So that's the P365 macro with uh, it's got an optics cut in there. Go ahead, what do, you, what do you think? This is a beautiful piece. It feels good too. Yeah. Yeah, it's got a nice It's nice, a nice and compact. on it, yep, yep. It's got a good grip to hold with. This is nice, this is a nice piece. So there's a business card in there. So just take that with you, reach out to Jason. I think he's got something he wants to send you. Might yeah. look very similar to that. Okay. But um, yeah. Would you carry that? I would consider carrying something like this, especially if I was carrying it um, on business or if I was somewhere without my children nearby, mm -hmm. right? If I was going somewhere solo, because this is, this is all the best parts of SIG, right? What, I, what I've always liked about SIG is that its balance is right, right? The quality and craftsmanship is really high. They generally tend to be kind of uh, 
mistake forgiving, right? So if you don't clean it as often as you should, if you uh, if you get it dirty, if you drop it, right? They don't. They tend to be a very a very solid piece. Yeah, and that's something I've always really enjoyed about Sig. Yeah. So. Yeah, this is something I would definitely consider carrying. All right, well, get in touch with Jason. Thank you, Jason. <laughs> but all right, let's get to the show. <laughs> 